I'm Alice Friedman, one of the co-directors of the uh, architecture program, and um, it's a, my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, short uh, one an hour, hopefully plus, um, discussion about our beautiful new um, renovation in addition to Pendleton West. Um, where people, even as we speak, I just ran out and are dancing off the building <laughs> with um, uh, the musicians up in a kind of music gallery up on the, on the building, which I haven't really focused on Jewett being able to produce that. Um, but it's an, it's an incredible um, thing. So as all of you know, probably at Wellesley, we focus on product and process both in the making of the arts the making and the studying of the arts both. And I've been told uh, many times that we're uh, extremely process-oriented in our decision-making. Um, and so to get to this point, we have spent seven, eight years uh, of process. Um, and I wanted, before Marty introduces our speakers, to just acknowledge some of the people who have participated in that process. Um, we started seven or eight years ago with a um, feasibility study by Graham Gund Architects, and we were also at that same point as a college and as a departments of art and music, uh, media arts and sciences and CAMS, so we're many-headed monster. Uh, thinking about the program and what we wanted to do, how we wanted to move through the building, what needed to be next to what, uh, where the building should be. Um, and in those conversations, before we even picked an architect, uh, we had a project team that consisted of um, members of the art and music departments, and then eventually the, these people got titles, the client leads, Martin Brody, uh, Phyllis McGibbon, um, and our executive sponsor was Cappy Lynch, who's in uh, return to private life uh, from the dean's office <laughs> and is um, a distinguished member of the English department, but was the uh, dean at the time. Um, we had to choose had the great pleasure, actually, of going through the process of choosing an architect. Uh, and we're lucky enough to um, hire Steve Kieran of Kieran Timberlake of Philadelphia, uh, who's going to be one of our main speakers. And as some of you already know, the master plan and the planning of the landscape, which, as you can see when you look at the building, is a very critical part of it, uh, is um, under the direction of um, Michael Van Valkenburg and Jesse Nicholson is going to speak for Michael, who's not uh, well today. So, um, Emily Mueller de Sellis are, is uh, from the um, MVV is also here. That's a great reunion. And um, of course, uh, Vaso Mathis, uh, who was the project architect for us, and um, uh, John Alvarez, a de director of design and construction, our dear friends. Um, and Pete Zorao, uh, who was director of facilities, uh, was um, a very much a part of that process. Um, you know, it was through all of this seven years of discussion that I truly earned my reputation as a bad-tempered but very kindly and thoughtful person. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel things, I have very strong opinions on things, but Fortunately, we had a wonderful team of people who, um, through the part of the process that I was um, engaged with uh, in the early period, then the rest of it was picked up mostly by music and studio um, and the architects, obviously, and all that hard work I didn't um, really deal with. Um, the, um, just to say a few words about the site, uh, we, one of the odd things about the feasibility study was the proposal of a site out on Severance Green that would have required us to build. And if you look at it, even at this very moment right now, it's one of the most beautiful things you ever saw in your life. It's beautiful green, sacred 
center of the Wellesley campus. Uh, and I say that truthfully, I think that's the case. And it was going to go out over Jewett Road and, you know, this like sort of spider leg going out you know, onto, um, onto Severance Green. But we ended up taking a wonderful risk, I think, of going right onto the even, in some ways, more special and sacred part of the campus, uh, right onto the academic quad. Um, and I have to say, from the bottom of my heart, that uh, our confidence in Steve uh, and um, in the uh, landscape architects and Michael was, is richly rewarded by the beauty of this building. Um, we also, John will be able to speak to this if there are questions, uh, went through many, many weeks, months, felt like years, talking to trustees and others about concrete and the beauties thereof. Um, <laughs> And I think, again, I, I'm so ha truly happy and gratified that the building is so incredibly beautiful and it's made of concrete. Uh, the color, the texture, everything about it rewarded us, rewarded our confidence, I think. Um, and I hope the trustees agree. <laughs> um, and then the one last thing I'll say before Marty um, takes over is, um, that another part of our process, this seemingly endless process, was the idea of how to, once we built the building, how to hide it again, how to make it like a Wellesley building that fit into its site. Was a good friend to Jewett, um, which we spent a lot of time studying in the last few years for in our conservation report for the Jewett Art Center, um, how to make it like our other buildings that uh, fit and hug the hills and uh, relate to the open spaces and relate to the hillsides. The idea of what's now becoming clear, clear and clear, this green veil of plantings um, that integrates the new building into the landscape and um, creates, uh, I think, again, a very beautiful realization of the spirit of the place that is our campus. Um, it's an idiosyncratic campus. I um, hope Steve will talk some about the way that the buildings relate to each other and to the hills, but also the way the stairs hug buildings and come up around. Oh, and I should say, and now I promise I'll go. Um, when you walk up the hill to Pendleton West, please notice um, the survival of the Rudolph little skinny staircase in addition to the big wide one. Some people call them Gertrude and Alice. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was um, not a uh, decision driven by a great regard for budget. Um, it was dr driven by a regard for history and design and the experience of how you move through. Uh, those are very peculiar little steps uh, that Rudolph did, but they're absolutely um, fantastic examples of Rudolph's design and his odd way of thinking about a parallelogram as a stair dread. Um, but go ahead and have a look at that. Uh, Steve made it possible for us to keep those. John made it possible. Uh, the trustees and uh, the president uh, gave us the confidence to, to do something like that. And it just, um, for me, who pushed and shoved and jumped up and down a lot and complained, uh, it's very gratifying to see them watch this, such a beautiful realization. Anyway, so Marty, uh, I'll turn this over to Marty, who will say a few words about process again. Thank you. Right here. Thank, you. Thank you, Alice. And I am going to introduce our two speakers, but I'm also going to indulge in a few comments of, of mine about the background of the project. And as Alice has already suggested, today is a little bit of a reunion. Uh, there are many people in this room, those that she mentioned, and faculty as well, who worked on this project for a long, long time. And it was uh, an extremely gratifying project for us to work on together. Um, so uh, it's just great to be back together with everybody who's worked on it and to celebrate this time with everyone who's here. Um, I think I'll just introduce both speakers now so you don't have to hear from me, but I am going to make a few more comments before doing that. Uh, and uh, I wanted to elaborate on what Alice was saying and provide a little more context, um, especially about the program discussions that we had 
before we began work uh, with Karen Timberlake, because uh, I think it'll, it'll uh, help us understand the enormity of their accomplishment here. And I have to warn you, this is kind of a pre-Halloween Valentine to Steve, you know, uh, be, and it's not coming just from me, it's coming from a number of people in this room. Uh, so our planning process uh, had been deliberative, I would say, Alice, as Alice said, we plan a lot here and we process a lot, and we had had a very deliberate and refined process from the start of this project, uh, but the program itself was unresolved when we began working with Steve and his team. It began with a meticulous space study that Alice also mentioned of the studio art and music facilities. This was done by Graham Gunn Partnership. Gunn gave us a very fine report that laid out a range of possibilities for fixing and improving our facilities. At the base, it designated the space and resources needed to maintain the established studio art programs in a healthy and safe environment, but it also indicated the scale of the resources that would be needed to go further, and it went a lot further. It went way further than we were able to do. Um, in light of this report, the college approved an ambitious but still relatively modest program given the range of options that were on the table. The approved scope focused on traditional studio art and music disciplines with the aim of right-sizing our studios and addressing health and safety issues. A new element was also approved, a sorely needed rehearsal room for large music ensembles that hadn't been anticipated uh, some 50, 60 years before when Jewett was built. In sum, and I'm gonna put it bluntly, it seemed that we needed to sacrifice a glimpse of a future vision, a vision of the future, in order to address the urgent needs of the present. This, of course, was not altogether satisfactory to anyone, and a large number of faculty and staff, with the blessings of senior administration and with the collaboration of senior administration, met intensively in the fall of 2013 to clarify a baseline vision for the future, one in which interdisciplinary creativity would be central and digital media would flourish alongside traditional programs. But there was no rabbit in our hat, no clue about how to design this outcome, which seemed to exceed the scope of our program. Enter Kieran Timberlake. Steve and his colleagues worked the, ma the needed magic. They transformed the challenges we faced into a key that unlocked program design. They affirmed our vision. They guarded a large, diverse, and I have to say sometimes cantankerous group of faculty and staff through a set of brilliant and incisive program design exercises. They clarified and sharpened the program by manifesting it in space. Their process was fastidious, articulate, and evolutionary. It was also empathic. They didn't just study us, they identified with us. Uh, even as they uh, considered the potential for our project to impact the college as a whole. Their solutions always transcended the problems they addressed. They knew Wellesley already, especially by their work on the chapel. They know it much, much better now and they designed with an eye uh, toward the future, as well as the larger campus context. Steve, we're enormously grateful to you. Uh, and I'll now introduce, say a few words about you. Steve Kieran is a founding partner of Kieran Timberlake, which was established in 1984. <laughs> Under his guidance, the firm has received over 160 design citations, including the AII, AIA Firm Award in 2008, the Cooper, Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in 2010. In 2001, Steve and his partner, James Timberlake, were the inaugural recipients of the Benjamin Latrobe Fellowship for Architectural Design Research from the AIA College of Fellows. Since 2002, they have co-authored five books on architecture. In addition to his work on our campus, Steve's recent projects included the US Embassy in London, house renewal projects at Harvard University, a new school of engineering at Brown University, and three new student buildings on the University of Washington's North Campus. And he's also taught all over the country. So a very busy uh, firm and a very busy individual who nonetheless really became a member of our community. Um, we also, of course, been thrilled and, and uh, and have benefited over the years from our association with Michael Van Volkenberg's uh, firm. Uh, and uh, again, the, the recent projects of this firm are quite extraordinary. They include the ongoing completion of the Brooklyn Bridge Park, a realignment and urban transformation of Toronto's Don River, and the Monk's Garden at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Uh, in 2010, 
Van Volkenberg Associates' design for Brooklyn Bridge Park was awarded the prestigious Brendan Gill Prize from the Municipal Art Society of New York, presented to the work of art in a given year that best captures the spirit and energy of New York City. And of course, their work here has captured uh, the spirit of Wellesley quite beautifully for quite some time now. Uh, we're going to hear today from Jesse Nicholson, who began his career as a designer on Martha's Vineyard. As a member of Michael Van Volkenberg Associate design team, he's contributed to the design development and construction documentation for Bloomingdale Trail in Chicago, the George W. Bush Presidential Library in Dallas, the Elmwood Residence Forest Re Restoration Project in Cambridge, a residential design on Nantucket, and several residential projects on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, currently, Jesse has been assisting with 3D modeling and graphics for the University of Washington framework, and he's received numerous awards from the American Society of Landscape Architecture. He's also the recipient of the 2013 Olmsted University Scholar Award, and he's spent a lot of time digging in the earth on our campus here and knows it very, very well. So I'll turn things over now to Steve. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see if we can get the images back here. I am so happy to be here and to have this opportunity tonight. And early this morning when uh, Mike became apparent, Michael could not join us. Uh, he had this to say. He said, uh, in essence, that it's, it's kind of rare at a moment of dedication that you get to explain yourself. And he was very, very much looking forward to that. Um, as am I, so uh, I'm really, really pleased to be with you tonight. Uh, a word to begin with here about um, this remarkable place, uh, Wellesley College. Uh, most of you are of this place or know it well, if not all of you. And it's a campus of hills and vales and um, um, threaded in between the hills and vales and their topography. Usually the vales are green meadows and the hills are lined with um, what Michael Van Valkenburg has called the Green Vale. Um, but none of those hills is greater than Norumbega. There's a 19th century map of it depicted here um, before any of what you know today was present there. And there's a quote from Frederick Law Olmsted Jr.'s letter to um, the then president of Wellesley, President Hazard, um, written in 1902, I think March of 1902. And um, he, uh, he had this to say, really, that um, with regard to the plateaus, and this is a very, very beautiful piece of writing that describes a design act more carefully than most any drawing I know. He said, the plateaus are somewhat larger and are made of two fairly distinct parts, the upper flat part and the escarpment, so that a dividing line of construction which follows the edge of the flat simply recognizes a natural division. Um, very, very precise description of how to design Norumbega Hill for the future. And uh, not a lot happened immediately but um, a lot was on the way. Um, pretty soon thereafter, by 1934, um, uh, the, that basic idea of the escarpment with buildings lining it was already in position. Um, Founders Hall, Green Hall, Pendleton Hall all followed the exact description of Olmsted 30 years before by not building in the center of that plateau, which the earlier buildings that were there were located in the center, but instead following the ring of the escarpment and negotiating the grade change from outside the Great Hill to the top of it. Uh, very, very remarkable piece of master planning and campus design that lives with us to this day. So, uh, you know, and again, you can get a feel for what that looks like in that bottom set of images that are all taken around the base of Green Hall as it negotiates that grade change. Um, along comes Paul Rudolph then in uh, 1952 and, uh, well, mid-50s or so. His building was completed in 58, I believe. And um, you can see a couple of buildings were taken down that were still on the edges of Norumbega Hill to make, well, to make way for the Jewett Center for the Arts. 
um, which you can see depicted in the image at the lower right. Um, he too, um, now 50 plus years later after Olmsted's drawing, followed that precept very precisely. He too positioned, positioned his building um, not on the top nor at the bottom, but on the escarpment, on the slope in between. And that building also negotiates the grade from the lower level up to that flat plane in the middle, um, forming what is today the academic quad. It's a real acropolis, if you will, of, um, uh, of Wellesley. And um, a lot of it, you know, is just good vernacular planning. Hill towns do that all the time. It's, uh, um, but it was good sound planning before Olmsted. It's good sound planning after Olmsted. Uh, the other contribution of Rudolph was really the program. And um, Norumbega Hill at that point had, it, it was the paragon of liberal arts learning on its way in America, if you think about what was already there. The sciences were in Pendleton Hall, the humanities um, were in Green Hall. Um, it needed the arts, and this building, Jewett, brought the arts holistically, all of them together in one single complex, performing arts, music, dance, visual arts, everything, including criticism and art collecting and history in one single complex as a unified liberal arts approach to the teaching of art on a, um, on a great acropolis, the academic quad, a unified place of representing all that made up the liberal arts, science, the arts themselves, the humanities. Pretty remarkable um, moment of transition and vision. Took about 50 years to get there, but it's the power of a good plan, um, power of a good sentence, power of a few great words. Um, so um, Rudolph um, traversed the escarpment with this great um, passage um, beneath the building. Um, you come beneath that passage, entering up the stairs, and the tower of Green Hall appears before you. I think you could safely say he made that quad better than it was before he got there. And, um, um, but if you look very carefully, there's um, a red dashed line um, to the left of the image um, around the stair Alice just referenced. And um, at that time in the 1950s, Clearly, the main entrance was underneath the <coughs> Jewett Arts Center up into the quad. And that was a very secondary thought at that moment. It was a very tertiary passage at best. Um, so keep your eyes on that. It figures large in this. So, um, so what started to happen? You know, all of life, it seems to me, tends toward entropy. Um, in science and in art and in our relationships even with people. People move out um, and so do buildings. So um, Rudolph had created this singular center and in the 1970s, the sciences moved out of Pendleton over to a new building. And I'm, I wasn't here, I, but I'm imagining people said, well, what are we gonna do with Pendleton? And the arts had grown clearly by then. so. Um, the visual arts were moved into Pendleton, which had been a chemistry building before Pendleton West. Um, and they basically reoccupied those spaces with very little renovation at that time. So that was step one. Then um, uh, you can see, uh, you know, that, that movement literally of the arts. Um, and Subsequently, in the 1990s, the collection and a lot of the art history teaching spaces um, moved out into Davis. So instead of one building for the arts, we now had three. Those three buildings were connected, um, I believe at the time, the Maneo building, the Davis building was um, done. Davis Art Museum, the building we're in now, I, they were connected by two bridges at that point to try and string the three, ba the three beads back together into a whole. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna offer a, a few comments about that whole. And, um, uh, you know, in my own view at the time when I came and looked at the campus, 
it wasn't getting you back to where Rudolph had it when everybody was in one building. So one of the questions for us is how do we reintegrate the complex? Um, the other thing that started to happen was um, the development of the campus. It started to move west. And this is an MVVA plan. I don't know when this was done, 2000 maybe, earlier or later, something around then. But um, the valley itself? Yeah, no, the big plan for that whole area. It's so, um, but you can see considerable development mapped out there, not just in the landscape, but in new buildings. The um, the campus center that's uh, developed there, the new parking structure, the recreational and athletic space has moved over there. So considerable development um, further to the west that was never envisioned in the 50s. And um, at that point, what was a very secondary four-foot wide stair that Rudolph had presided on that end of the building um, now was one of the principal ways people were actually moving up into the into the academic quad. So, so those are two forces at work here. I think of change on a campus that, in part, the new building had to address and the renovations had to address. So, um, you know, basically, we sought to accommodate a way to move from the West Campus along College Road and up into the academic quad that would be fully accessible. As important as the academic quad is symbolically and factually to Wellesley College, it was not accessible, not a good thing um, at all today. So finding a way through this project to make it accessible along that passage was important. Um, the, the building really is a nexus, if in many ways, of movements across the campus. Students living to the north across Munger Meadow and the residential facilities come across and up the hill through the site. Um, anybody going back and forth from the campus center or athletic facilities to the academic quad moves through the site that way. Um, so in some ways, the Rudolph entrance, the big entrance beneath Jewett, um, while still important um, in a factual way in terms of the number of people actually moving about the campus, um, was becoming somewhat secondary to these new passages through that um, northwest corner of the academic quad where the new building is located. So back to hill towns here. Um, w one of the first thoughts we it wasn't first thoughts, actually. It took a while to get there. We, we kept thinking we were going to be building a, a building addition to Pendleton and a bridge to Jewett. And the, the breakthrough moment, on a, in, in a way, was when we started to change the words. And you know, words always have huge meaning to designers. They affect how you think and conceive. And when we started to think about the addition not as a, an, just an addition to Pendleton, but as a portal to the academic quad. It changed everything for us in many regards. So um, we started to think about it, um, and that's Civita Vecchia on the left there. Um, and if you kind of squint at the image on the left and you think of the, the passage that MVVA has designed up the steep slope um, to that corner of the campus, and look at the portal at the end of it, that's kind of what we were thinking of, was that um, a bridge will never have the impact. Um, it, they're, they're just different fundamentally from portals. And uh, you know, if you look at this slide, the, the bridge on the left that we replaced, going between Jewett on the right and Pendleton on the left, um, you know, bridges just, all they fundamentally do is they connect two points together across a chasm that you can pass through, whether it's a bridge over a river, bridge over a road or a walk, that's what they do. Um, they can be poetic, um, but a portal is quite a different thing. When you use the word portal, you start thinking more about um, a threshold, uh, a point of change. You start thinking that there's something outside it and something inside it. It's a, it's a much more laden word. Um, you know, about outer worlds and inner worlds, about beyond the academic quad and within the quad. 
um, outside the buildings, inside the buildings. So that, that shift meant a lot to us and really generated um, a lot of what the building became and how it relates to both Pendleton and Jewett. Um, lots of pragmatic things had to occur here. Um, as I mentioned, this is at a, um, a, a point of confluence, of connection um, in the campus. So we had three different entries to the building. The first and most important is the entry at level one. Um, along the arts passage is uh, the term we use to describe that space. Uh, that's really the new front door for the arts at Wellesley, and it's part of that portal and passage is passing into the arts as well as through the arts and into the academic quad. Um, the um, other really important door on the north side, at the very top, you see the arrow coming in from the north side. That's what makes the building accessible and makes the campus fully accessible. Um, you can come, students can come across on a daily basis from residence halls, come in that way, but you can also come through there on a wheelchair and come in at that level and move all the way up through the building, um, about 25, 30 feet to the academic quad at level two. So that was the second one. And the third was we, um, put a new door, a new passage through Pendleton where an old window had been from the academic quad going into the um, new art spaces. So those were three doors into the complex. And then there were a series of connections. Um, we had to connect to Pendleton at all levels, one, two, and three. So you can see um, the, uh, the hallway paralleling the stair that connects to Pendleton at levels one and two. And then all the way up at the top of the building, there's a bridge, um, Marty's Legato, we call it now, that um, connects to Pendleton at that level. And of course, there's the connection across to Jewett. So, so this building is really doing a lot at the campus scale in terms of movement and circulation and a connection. Um, a few words about Pendleton um, itself. And uh, um, as I said, it had not been converted really fundamentally when the arts moved in. And uh, the arts are actually a lot like the sciences in this regard, that they each have to move a lot of air and um, have a lot of concerns about air quality in them. Uh, so. It, wasn't, it was a smart move, I think, back when that occurred and probably served you decently, but not well. And a lot had to change in, in Pendleton, including air handling and the management of air to, to keep the air quality safe in the building. But um, the biggest change, though, that we made ultimately was the corridor in the building. And um, if you kind of squint at... Um, at Pendleton in the image above. To me, in hindsight now, it looks like a loft building to me. Um, looks like an industrial loft that has Gothic windows and peaked roofs on it. And I say that for just a couple of reasons. One, it's got huge floor to uh, ceiling heights, got tremendous windows, huge windows. Um, and it's a concrete frame columniated building. So um, it was really an artist's loft waiting to happen. So um, that's what we did. So we uh, cleared out the corridor, that double-loaded corridor down the middle. And the most important act of design in a way here was an act of deletion, you know, deleting a lot of those walls in the building and opening it up, kind of revealing the soul of it as the loft building that it really always wanted to be for the arts. Um, and we had to move a classroom um, toward Pendleton East that was really not part of the arts program. And then we made a decision to move the stair and the elevator out of Pendleton and into the new building. They were not code compliant, either of them, and uh, really couldn't be effectively rebuilt. So we basically cleared the building out, and we had a big loft left. And um, that's what it yields, before and after. And, um, uh, you would not have known what the bones of that building were underneath it from going into it um, before we began work. 
Um, but it turns out to be quite a remarkable artist loft that would have anybody in New York drooling over this as a space to work in. So um, you can see the revelation of the systems at the top of it. The concrete is revealed. Um, building systems are all revealed. Um, Uh, there's Carlos um, doing his, uh, his professorial duties there. Um, that's a north-facing window. So you can see some beautiful north-facing windows. Right across the way, um, you can see some south-facing windows um, where the light is cast more deeply into the space, creating patterns on the floors. And in a loft building like this, Students can and do move. Teachers can and do move. Everybody had their own compartmentalized room and space before. Um, you can and will move and do move around the building. Danielle was, uh, was telling me earlier that um, she literally has her students moving and circulating and making art in different places depending upon the, the circumstances of what they're doing. So. Um, and um, uh, lastly, there are just some really, really wonderful spaces. This is up on level three. For stormwater management reasons, we put um, uh, sedum roofs, thin roofs of green on it. And um, the end result is that we've kind of elevated the meadows of Wellesley to the roofscape. And you can still see the green veil of the trees beyond, but at an altogether new plane. Uh, and really importantly, we um, have created a home for the digital arts, the media arts, huge part of art making today, um, a part that at the outset, um, everybody was trying to struggle about how to fit into the program. But once we took all the circulation space out of the building, we took the building's um, efficiency of use is a term we architects um, use and uh, facilities planners use all the time, your net to gross ratio up to almost 80% in the old Pendleton. And typically for a building like this, it'd be about 55%. So that extra 25% was the missing program that was spoken about earlier today that we were able to get into the building. And it's had all the positive benefits, frankly, of an open building where um, you don't feel like you're intruding when you open a door into a classroom because it's all open. And the faculty and the students are merging the arts together literally today. They want to be doing that, and the building is enhancing it. Um, a little, few words just about the massing on the building, and uh, and I'll wrap this up. Um, the rehearsal hall had to be quite high to make um, the music and the performance of that music, but you can see it's basically a three-level building. You enter from the north at level zero. The arts passage is in the middle, going through and up to the quad at level one. And the quad is all the way up at level two. Um, the passages. Um, this is a, a passage from the academic quad and a view through the building in between um, the framing of the building by Jewett on the left and Dan Clowder's um, Pendleton on the right, and the framing of the new building in between and the passage down the slope, the quality of that passage. Um, and this is a view that's our reinterpretation of, um, uh, of Olmsted's um, you know, notion about traversing the slope. And if you look at Green Hall, you're going to see terraces around the back of Green Hall. You'll see stairs that wrap around the building. And this is a stair that's entered from the north, opposite Munger, Me uh, opposite Munger Meadow. And you pass in between two walls. You can experience the passage of light on that concrete. Then you turn the corner and move up to the Arts Passage. Um, the massing of the building, this is um, uh, an elevation of the whole of the north facade of Pendleton and Green and Jewett and Davis. Um, with the green veil of trees stripped out of it, so you can see the massing. Um, and this is the new addition in it. We thought of the addition, um, Green Hall, or rather Pendleton Hall, has three 
um, perpendicular pavilions with gable ends almost that extrude out of the curving, the gently curving bar that makes up Pendleton. And we thought of our building, as I said, as an addition to Pendleton, and we thought of this as a fourth pavilion, um, again, connected back to Pendleton behind. Um, and, uh, you know, that was literally how we thought of it and the fit of the massing. Uh, interestingly, and what we weren't necessarily thinking about this at the time, um, we think it draws Davis into the conversation a little more than it had beforehand. The proportions of the new building are about the same but it, as Davis, but it's a much, much smaller pavilion. But it starts to draw the volume of Davis into that um, conversation along the flank of Pendleton. Um, in terms of materials, we were moved by two circumstances, the built Wellesley and the natural Wellesley. Both are wondrous circumstances. The built Wellesley um, had two brick buildings adjoining um, our site. Um, the um, Dan Clowder building had limestone trim um, around the windows and portals. And the Rudolph building used precast concrete, exposed aggregate precast around its windows and edges. And our thought here with this very small building was to basically work off of the, the, the honorific materials around the windows and of both Jewett and Pendleton and go in the direction of limestone colored concrete for the building to kind of elevate it to a kind of more honorific portal or passage status. And the other thing that was really m moving us all the way along was the, just the sheer landscape beauty of this place, of this campus, of the woods, the woodland vales. Um, very, very moving. So we asked ourselves, how do we take both of those worlds into the material world of this new building? So it's both of the built world of Wellesley and of the natural world of Wellesley. And we started to think about the trees outside basically um, becoming part of the building inside. We um, started to conceive of this really as a wooden building fundamentally. The memory of wood outside, which is what precast concrete does, it leaves its memory. Um, the wood leaves its memory in the concrete and then literal wood inside, um, deployed you know, literally to um, uh, create um, appropriate uh, amounts of reflection and absorption for the acoustical performance of the room, kind of making the room a little bit like the sounding box of a piano. Uh, and inside, we started to think about how we could let light down into the space. Lots of performance halls, as you know, don't have light or windows in them. The, the majority don't, probably. Only the old ones do. This is a rehearsal hall, not a performance hall. And we studied it carefully um, to, to bring light into the space in ways that would not get in the way of, um, of performers through some high openings. We um, also wanted views out. So at two of the four corners, you can actually see out into the landscape beyond. We think um, all human beings will make better music in the presence of light and view. Um, the salon is an intimate single story room immediately below the rehearsal hall. And you can see a pair of windows again with views out to Munger Meadow beyond. Oops. Um, and a corner of that really kind of bringing the whole assemblage together, the tree outside. Um, which became the formwork for the concrete and the memory of the wood in the concrete at the building envelope. And inside becomes, in milled form, the actual wood of, that lines the interior. Um, so just to close this, it's a real workhorse of a building on a lot of levels. It's a little, the little building that could is how I think about it in wood. Um, it's, uh, it's connecting and entering and fusing together the campus, we believe, making the campus whole again in this important corner, um, making the buildings um, assembled together again into a unified whole, 
Uh, so it's a small but very important um, cogwheel in this corner of the campus, uh, performing a lot of pragmatic things, but um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of poetic things in terms of the dialogue between the old buildings and the new. Um, when you walk into the building, you, are, um, you think you're inside, but you're actually outside. Um, you're looking across a little scrim, a little green veil, um, with a huge window that frames Pendleton. So your attention's immediately drawn to the landscape again. So just when you thought you'd left the landscape, you're there again. And through that landscape, you see the architecture, you see Pendleton. And that's a view of Pendleton that couldn't have been afforded before and is framed there um, and is front and center every day that you enter into the building. Um, the building is kind of solid and dark below, and up top, it's the opposite. It's light and airy and open. And we think of this as kind of a passage through the meadow with the green roofs to either side that just happens to have uh, windows on the sides of it and wall and a roof on top of it. But it's basically uh, a meadow passage that connects back to Pendleton at level three. Again, bringing landscape into it. And then lastly, the, the other type of passage that was very much on my mind throughout the whole of this, and Alice alluded to it at the um, outset, is this kind of historical conversation with um, one's predecessors. And in this case, it's um, Paul Rudolph on the left, um, uh, Dan Clowder on the right. And how does this building enter into a dialogue across time with those two different architectures? And um, without mimicking it, um, because you don't, I don't know, I think buildings that mimic ancestors, just like people that mimic ancestors, are, are not very lively, let's put it that way, being charitable. So the idea here was to engage in a sort of conversation across time with these different histories, try and make them better and more whole again for a new time, um, but leave them whole. And we did leave in the foreground, can you see it here, Alice? Yeah, you can see the, the stair on the left side of the passage. That's Paul Rudolph's old stair. So we deliberately decided, with Alice's urging, um, for sure, to, and, uh, you know, to, to leave it in position and put a new stair next to it. And those are the kinds of rich dialogues that I think you get into when you leave history and add to it rather than eradicate it on the one hand. Um, when you try to extend history and not mimic it on the other. And that kind of conversation, I think, is present on this campus. It's present in the best cities we make around the world. Um, and uh, was hugely on our mind as the third passage, literally, to go along with some of those pragmatic and poetic passages. So I'm going to turn this over to Jesse to um, present the landscape a little bit, and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to start with an aerial um, of Wellesley campus. And in, in the yellow, um, we have the project site. And something I want to point out is this aerial was taken before the completion of the project. And um, what you can see here clearly is the campus center in the foreground and the ap academic quad in the background. And you can see um, within the project site actually breaks in the Woodland Vale in Norm Vega Hill here. And that was a major catalyst and design move that MVVA and uh, Kieran Timberlake pointed out very early on and, and brought through the ent entire design process. I'm going to give a little bit of history of Wellesley, but be very careful because I'm probably the least, uh, probably shouldn't, <laughs> but I'm going to give a little history here. Um, when the campus was bought by the Durants, it was majority farmland. And then, so that means that they had to be, create a cultivated nature. And everything that you see on Wells' campus for the most part has been planted. Um, and this picture here is talking to that 
cultivated nature, and that's a big part of what MVVA has done at Wellesley over the last 20 years. And I'm going to use this diagram here to, to show that. It's a little washed out, but you can see, as, as Steve and Alice uh, framed for me, is that the, the campus and all of the development is based on uh, buildings on hilltops or the escarpments, and then a system of open valleys. And you can see here, um, MVVA has been working with, with Wellesley for 20 plus years to continue that historic development planning. And you can see here, um, I wish this wasn't as washed out as it is, um, the valleys, and then in orange um, is Pendleton, and it, it sits at this really opportune moment on the Norman hillside as a connector to the campus center back to the academic quad. Two projects um, that I'm going to share that came out of the master plan work are great examples of projects, small and large, that can help with incre incremental change to a campus such as Wellesley. So this is Harris Courtyard, and as the campus evolved, the use of the space evolved. So probably um, at the outset, they didn't think that there would be cars there. Um, so MVVA recognized this and, and took and, and used the existing assets of the site, the, the existing trees, the framing of the buildings to create um, this courtyard and, and, and created a, added a diversity with the, with the plant selection. So there's over 20 species of trees in this courtyard that didn't exist originally. And then everyone's familiar with the Lemonade Valley. This was um, originally a, a parking lot of 175 cars and it was, um, reconstructed or turn that into a five acre wetland. Um, very infrastructural based project, had to deal with water system, restoration efforts, but also um, major social, ecological, and um, important to the campus in terms of it would then be the home to the, to the campus center. In this photo is very striking. This is, was taken in 1960, and you can see um, the arboretum in the back. The campus is still um, maturing. Uh, the site here in, in um, the Jewett Arts Center is, you know, follows the diagram. It's sitting in the escarpment, but the landscape for the building hasn't quite caught up, um, as you can see in this photo here. The next piece of this I'm going to go through um, are the master plan recommendations <coughs> from 1998 that MVVA created with uh, the Wellesley and then there'll, there'll be a series of before and after images that we can, can walk through. Um, so this image again is a little bit washed out but this is standing on College, College Road, um, Munger Valley is behind you and something that you know we noticed right away was that this project site actually had a series of several small fragmented landscape. So there was this small orchard, a raised prairie, um, Norm Vega Hill, as I mentioned before, has been fractured. And what this landscape does here is it actually gives the Davis art maybe a little too much dominance, especially because um, that is the back of the building to College Road. So that was something that we, we noticed right away in, in, the, in the design process. You can just see with this photo here, not the exact same, but um, what we've done is a very aggressive um, restoration style of, of oak planting. So this here, um, we modeled this af after, after an Appalachian oak plant community, um, intensified the diversity, but also helped scale the building. This is a view, um, the campus center would be to your back, and some things that we pointed out is um, just your clear sight line into the loading dock um, of Davis. The, the path up to the academic quad was never totally considered and actually quite hard to walk up. It was about 12%. Um, the vegetation here is, is very dwarfed and, and you can feel that in this image for sure. And then um, this next shot is a, a drone shot that we sketched over to, to point some of these things out. So working with uh, Kieran Timberlake's office and just working at Wellesley in general, everyone knows topography, we love it. It's excellent, it's what makes this campus dynamic, but it also, in terms of ADA, is very challenging because um, from the start of this um, is at elevation, let's say zero, to get in the ap academic quad, we're already up 20 to 25 feet. So in terms of traversing this hillside is very challenging. So that's part of um, 
what we did here is we had to create several different path networks and then choose our route of accessibility. So that's something I think Steve talked about very well before is that the different levels. So we chose that level zero, which is on the north side, would be the accessible route. Um, so this is just showing all the different percentages and all of the numbers that we had to crunch. The um, red line in, in here is, was the existing curb line for the, t the Davis parking area. So you can see that we pushed the curb line back, narrowed the entrance into the Davis Art Museum loading dock so that we're screening it off and, and calling what we're creating a, like a parking garden. And this allowed us to meet those um, under 5% grades that we needed for accessibility. Without um, that small land grab, we wouldn't be able to do that. But also by doing that, we were able to embed the parking so that it wasn't the first thing that you saw on College Road. The existing condition and how Pendleton um, sat on the hillside over time, Munger Valley actually started to creep up the hillside here a little bit. And you can see the eroded, um, the forest line here. And it, it created a little bit of confusion of, of when the hillside ended and when Munger Valley started. And this is the after image. So this is MVVA's um, proposed restitching the woodland veil. So this is, a, this is several different oak species, uh, flowering, small flowering native trees for the most part, filling in that gap. And over time, the vegetation will fill in this gap to have this building feel embedded or nestled in a Norm Vega Hill. And then I talked a little bit about grade before, extremely challenging. This is a very simple rise over run diagram showing what we had to start with. And just to get to level one of KT's building, there's 19 feet of grade change. And if you run a perfectly straight line, that's 12%. To be able to fall within ADA accessibility, you need 5%. So you have to stretch that almost 300 feet in a straight line, and we didn't have that. So that's part of why we have these long meanders. And when you are working with landscape, the meander allows you to experience the landscape differently than you would before. Um, and then this is a photo that we took during construction that we feel really helps show how we solved these uh, accessibility issues. Um, <laughs> And it gives you all the different elevations. So you can see that, you know, at College Road, we're close to 129. Davis, again, parking lot, that's going to be the main, the main parking area. So we had to create clear connections there. And then we worked to the Northern Passage and then up to the Arts Passage. And then as Steve pointed out before, um, the creation of the Campus Center created this thorough uh, thoroughfare or, or path that didn't, wasn't as stressed before. So the, the design consideration is figuring out a way to make this feel like the front door because it had always kind of had this back door treatment. Um, and in this, in this um, image here, you can see the meandering paths actually. Michael was out here with us uh, this spring strategically placing trees to help create these moments and views towards the campus center, keeping some of those existing views that we felt were really, really important. In and the meandering paths gives you vantage points and views of the Munger Valley System Hazard Quad and uh, the campus center that didn't exist before. Yeah. And the last piece of this is just some of the landscape strategies and data points and facts during construction that are very fascinating to this project. With a project site this small, and it kind of feels like Steve's office just dropped this building in, that's really not the case at all. It, Accessibility was an extremely large challenge of this project. Everything had to happen um, from College Road up to the building, all the formwork. So in the original site assessment, um, we wanted to try to keep as many oak trees as we could, but feasibility didn't allow that. So we, we kept um, three of the most beautiful oaks in a stand of hemlocks, and the rest of the site had to be, to be stripped. Um, in the early process, we did a lot of soil testing and found that there was a nice, you know, six to eight inches of existing soil on site. So we worked with Wellesley College to store it on campus and tried to amend and reuse as much of the existing soils as possible. Um, the site also offered a great um, base layer that was free draining and very sandy. Um, so we were able to use a lot of those site assets. So this drawing is showing 
um, the cut and then us filling it back up and giving us the soil profiles that we need to be able to um, create the revegetated Vega Hill. And then Steve talked about this some as well, but you know it was a great collaboration between KT's office and DBA and Wellesley. And there's these special moments I think you guys will notice. Um, you know, one is as you walk in, you get that view of Pendleton that didn't exist before. And MBBA and K KT worked very closely to figure out what that would be. And we wanted that to feel like a trapped little piece of the forest snuck in between these two buildings. And I think that we created that um, illusion. Um, and then on the right. Um, these are two other images. Again, it was really important to understand the relationship from um, views outwardly um, and strategically placing trees in this lower image not to um, totally out um, block the views to, to Munger Valley. And then something based on the accessibility to get to the site, um, we had to clear a big piece of it. So something that's, you know, landscape architects love is 40%, 45% of this project was actually new landscapes. Um, within that we used, before there was probably a handful of species, we introduced 20 new species of oaks, um, things that are majority native to New England and Wellesley's campus. There was 153 native trees, um, 475 shrubs, over 7,000 ground covers. With the planting composition, um, we tried to create an unfolding of different interests. So, you know, the oaks aren't necessarily known for being uh, the best for fall color that can be around. So we chose oaks, um, that red oaks, things that offer a really beautiful fall color, added um, gray birches, uh, one thing when you're planting on slopes that are so uh, steep, you can't plant very large or short trees. So that, that was part of our restoration planting style. So we added things like gray birches that can go in with smaller root balls and be a little bit taller. Um, added uh, some plants for great fall color with uh, witch hazels in, in early um, harbingers of spring. <laughs> And then uh, also, <laughs> uh, for spring and summer, um, one thing that we were really excited about is, is, is something we have to do is, you know, every landscape belongs to the space that it is in. So it's not just something that is artificial or, or new to the place. So because of our relationship with Wellesley over the last 20 years, we were able to go back and look at old plant lists and just know what we had planted in other places. So something that we're really excited for is next year in the Munger Valley system, along Hazard Quad about 15 years ago, we planted several red buds. And something that we wanted in this project was to, to, to add um, several red buds as well. So we're really looking forward to next spring that the valleys will be lined with red buds. Um, and there's also several species here that, that will bloom during commencement, your rhododendron azaleas, and then um, for students here in summer and staff, there's bottle brush buckeye and a few others. And then I'll end with um, this beautiful aerial of the project completed. We're running a little late, but we would like to take some questions. And perhaps we could have about five minutes for questions. Uh, and I, did, I think people know, but there is a reception immediately following this in the Lewis and Deborah DeHoyas music lobby of the new building. Uh, and so if you just head toward the new building, I'm sure you'll find the reception. But please do join us at the reception. But now, do you have some questions? Thank you both for your talks, which I, I find extremely helpful. Uh, I've been a great admirer of the interiors that you've created. But I find the bluntness of the concrete in a world of brick to be something that I'm still very puzzled over. And I didn't hear anything this evening that when I take tours and people say to me, why is it concrete? I, I have no answer to that question. So I, so I didn't convince you clearly tonight. So. I wonder if you could help me through the process. After all, brick is Wellesley. 
rhetoric is feminine. There's a whole literature in the construction of academic quad where Day and Cloud speak about the feminine qualities of Brick. Brick is to Wellesley as stone is to um, uh, men's colleges. A and those are con those aren't my contrasts. Right. Those are Dan Powder's contrasts. So could you could you sure. explain more fully why it's concrete? Well, a, a couple of things. There there is a lot of stone at Wellesley. The lower two levels of Pendleton along the whole north flank are stone. And um, so the pedestals or bases of the buildings tend to be, do have stone in them. It's only when they get on the flat up above that they're wholly brick. So most of this building is down slope um, and is coming out of that stone world. And we do have a stone base, a, a, a granite stone base on the building. You know, but I think the, you know, the, the fundamental um, logic behind it that I referenced in my description was that it's a portal. It's a passage, a moment of passage. Um, and those honorific moments, even at Wellesley, tend to have stone around them. But in this case, we were looking at the entirety of the building as a portal, as a passage. Um, and it's a small building. And we were looking to try and create a reference back to the natural world of landscape, to the trees, through the presence of wood in the face of the, of the concrete. So those were the things at the time that, and, and today, frankly, that were on our mind as that decision was made. Um, like all decisions in the realm of art and aesthetics, we're all entitled to um, differences of opinion. and. Uh, I will not change yours, um, you know, but I hope it grows on you over time and that as you see the building and the landscape start to come in, that it, um, you know, starts to become something that really does feel right. So we'll see. Time will tell. But any other questions? Well, first of all, congratulations on your beautiful building. Um, Thank you. I guess I'm, I'm curious, um, now that you've been through this process, looking back, if you could do one thing differently, what would it be? <laughs> uh, there's some things I can't say here this evening. So, and, uh, uh, so uh, 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 there's, you know, the, the reality of a custom building of this sort in a custom location um, is there are millions of decisions, literally, that go into it. And I'm not exaggerating when I say millions of individual decisions. And as a designer um, and architect, you try and create a culture of decision making because there are lots and lots of people making those decisions. Craftspeople out in the field, engineers, some are here tonight, LeMessure's here tonight, the structural engineer. Um, you know, literally decision after decision. So if I started going down the list of regrets, um, you know, it, it would probably, we, we'd be here longer, long past the cocktail hour. Um, you know, I do hope before I die to do a perfect building, but I've decided I'm giving up on it. It's not really a, a goal worth pursuing. And, uh, you know, you just try and, you know, make things better and better. So, you know, not a lot comes to mind on the fundamentals, frankly. I think we, we worked real hard on it across time. We worked critically. We got a tremendous amount of really wonderful criticism here at Wellesley. And, um, uh, that just made the building better and better and better. And the more constraints we layered onto this, the better the building got. And every time somebody said something like, you got to keep that stair, it seemed crazy at the moment. Now I can't imagine it without it. So n not a lot of fundamental regrets, lots of, um, lots of modest ones. And uh, one of my, um, I, the architects I mentored for as a very young architect were uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, and he said, never tell anybody something you regret. 
it'll show up in the newspaper the next day. So. <laughs> Martha. Steve, do you have a um, moment in the building that you like best? Can you? I know oh, we boy. love all our children, but is there a particular part of the building yeah, that you I mean, particularly like? Mm -hmm. I, I feel about this building, I, I've called it medieval modern, and um, like all of the medieval world, there are lots of wonderful moments in it. And, um, um, you know, we tried to craft openings for specific purposes, you know, but one, one that, you know, would come to mind off the top of my head is at the, as you, descend from the academic quad down and you arrive at the base of the stair, you've walked along the Rudolf stair on your left and you arrive at that flat space of the arts passage, immediately to your right is a sliver of a window that allows you a view through that, um, that solid foundation wall into the interior of the building. And then when you go inside the building, um, you look back the opposite way and it frames the Rudolph building and there's a little fragment pulled out of the, um, the, uh, the top of the Dan Clowder building there, a sunburst piece of ornament that flanks the window. And, um, you know, that's, that's a favorite, you know, moment. Just a little glance that um, was deliberately located, deliberately proportioned, so it's kind of the size of a human body. It's very vertical and relatively thin. It's kind of an invitation to put yourself in it in the way one puts <coughs> oneself in Gothic architecture that's kind of scaled to the body, that sets up views to new things and old things, brings fragments of old things into new things, and starts, you know, in just a kind of wonderful moment there to extend that dialogue across the buildings, across Pendleton, Jewett, and the new building. <coughs> Well, I think on that note, actually, we should say thank you to our speakers and let people go and look at that beautiful poet and moment. All right. <laughs>